Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Feeding His Sheep. I'm your host, Rick Griffin, and today we're going to be in Mark chapter 3, covering verses 7 through 15. Now, where we left off last time, the Pharisees had begun to plot the death of Jesus. Those people who claimed, you know, to have an inside track with God. Those who should have spent their time making God known to the people. Instead, they're trying to murder God in human flesh. The Pharisees prided themselves in obedience to the law. They thought that they were doing the right thing. I mean, after all, the law still commanded that blasphemers should indeed be put to death. And just like the Apostle Paul, when he still went by Saul of Tarsus, they were running a hundred miles an hour in the wrong direction. Instead of serving God, in reality, they were fighting against him. The problem was Jesus was not a blasphemer. He could actually back up his claim. Has any blasphemer ever cast out demons? Have any of those ever claiming to be Messiah before Jesus ever healed the sick or healed the lame? And I'm not talking about unseen ailments like these faith healers on TV. I mean real, visible ailments that were cured. Has any other person that the Pharisees had attacked, have they ever had the ability to read their minds and their hearts as Jesus did? I dare say not. Did anyone that the Pharisees accused previously ever turn water into wine? At this point in Jesus' ministry, this has already occurred in John chapter 2. Their accusations against Jesus were blasphemy and violating the Sabbath. And neither one was true. He indeed is the Son of God, as God had verbally declared with a voice from heaven at the baptism of Jesus. And nowhere in Scripture does it say that you cannot do a miraculous healing on the Sabbath. The only laws violated were the man-made laws, the man-made additions that the Pharisees had put into it. So in the previous study, Jesus took off the gloves and he exposed their man-made traditions for what they really were, an unnecessary burden for the people. And it's become an apostate form of Judaism that God had never intended for the law to become. Jesus has shown that he has authority over sickness. He has authority over disease, authority over sin, authority over temptation, authority over nature, and even authority over demons. And then he delivered the finishing blow to their little cult that they created by stating that he is Lord over their Sabbath. Now, these Pharisees, they could have done their research. They could have seen the record of his birth in Bethlehem. The census and the records at the temple all prove that he was there, and this proves his claim to messianic fulfillment. Everyone in Jerusalem was there when they seen the Magi arrive and start to ask questions about him. They knew the passage in the Psalms that said the desert nomads would come bearing gifts, and boom, there were, there were, there were the Magi right there. They could have researched the miracles that Jesus performed. They could have followed through with the lives that were changed and the, the change that was brought about by his ministry. They could have asked those that were present at his baptism what happened that day when heaven was torn open. But nope, their minds were made up. Their hearts were as hard as stone, and their spiritual eyes were closed tightly, and their feet were pointing away from God. Now, from the point in the first six verses in Mark chapter 3, throughout the rest of the gospel accounts, they sought fought and bought for the arrest of Jesus, whom they despised. They would nip at his heels the entire time, just relentlessly, everywhere he went, following him with the same accusations, the same lies, doing anything they could to derail his ministry. And they would not stop until they stood beneath his cross with their arms folded, mocking him. Little did they know that neither Jesus nor his ministry would stop at the cross. So in Mark chapter 3, let's begin this session with the verses 7 and 8. Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples, and a great multitude from Galilee followed, and also from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and beyond the Jordan, and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. A great number of people heard of all that he was doing and came to him. The first two words in this text here link these events with the fallout with the religious leaders. Jesus withdrew. He withdrew from the public eye, or at least he tried to. They still followed him in massive crowds wherever it was that he had went. In reality, I think this may have also been what angered the Pharisees more than anything. Yes, they claimed they had a zeal for the law, but they too broke the law. 
They so enjoyed the prestige and respect that their position had favored them with that they viewed this growing popularity of Jesus as a threat. They wanted the crowds to be admiring them, not following him. So everywhere he went, there was a crowd. And merely reading these words cannot begin to describe how large these multitudes were. Any attempt to put a number on these crowds would just be foolish of me and pure speculation, so I'm not going to try it. But I believe that when it says a great multitude, it means just that, a great multitude. Now look at the mix of people in this crowd from Judea and from Jerusalem. This is a broad description of the nation of Israel. There are a great number of Jews present listening to the teachings of this one who may just be the Messiah that they've been expecting. Then you have Idumea and beyond the Jordan. I hope I'm pronouncing Idumea right. You may not be familiar with that name, Idumea, but I bet you know it by its other name, Edom, the descendants of Esau, a group of half-Jews that were a constant thorn in the side of Israel all throughout their history. These people have traveled a distance of at least 60 miles on foot to see what Jesus is all about. Now that's dedication. How many of you have ever walked 60 miles just to go to church before? So these half-breeds, these Edomites, who were hated just as much as your average Samaritan, and for the same reason, they did. They made the journey. They and others others who were simply described as those beyond the Jordan River. Now, there were a few tribes of Israel, if you'll remember, that settled on the other side of the Jordan River when they first entered the land and began to conquer it. Now, I assume that this description of beyond the Jordan includes those distant tribes and likely some surrounding and neighboring nations as well. But look at this interesting mix of people you have here. You have the Jews, the pure Israelites, in whom the Messiah had been promised for many generations. And then you have some half-breeds, those who have largely been rejected and despised by the Israelites, and they're following this Jesus in whom that they're finding acceptance as well as healing. It's nice to be accepted for once and not just rejected or despised because of your nationality. And then you have those beyond the Jordan, those who are 100% Gentile, people who have not been brought up on the law and the prophets. They likely had no previous knowledge of the God of Israel or anything about his commandments or about the law or about Moses. But here they are, having made a very long journey to see what this Jesus is about and to follow him for whatever reason it may be. With that, let's move on to verses 9 and 10. And he told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for him because of the crowd, so that they would not crowd him. For he had healed many, with the result that all those who had afflictions pressed around him in order to touch him. You know, Jesus widely sent, wisely sent some of his disciples ahead to prepare a boat for him to stand in. The crowds had a tendency to be overwhelming. Some translations said so that they would not crush him. Now, Jesus was and is the Son of God. He could have used supernatural means to protect himself if need be, but he chooses this method. It's simple, and it's not going to scare the people, and it's going to be just as effective. He has a boat prepared where he can sit in the boat and stand offshore just a ways where the crowd can't press against him. Now, I have been in some crowds that's kind of like this before, but it was a, a less glorious setting. I'd attended some music concerts in the past that tended to be quite rowdy. Now, most of the time, I was never really scared of the, the crowds because of my size. You know, never once did I end up on the floor. Never once did I get trampled on. And sometimes smaller people would ask if they could stand behind me. But one time at a concert in Oklahoma City, probably about 20 years ago or so, things got a little out of hand. And that ended up being the last time I'd ever attended one. The security guards, they were being super super strict. I mean, these were muscled up versions of totalitarian school marms from the 1950s, and they're standing ready to swat anyone who ever gave them a sour look. So people were being thrown out over little things, despite not having broken any venue rules. Now, the tension escalated until it peaked mid-concert, and then all heck broke loose. And this is the first time in my life that I'd ever become scared of a crowd. I heard shouting. People were pressing and shoving more than usual. 
And then to my astonishment, I saw four security guards being carried out by six people per guard, and they tossed them outside the venue doors. There was only one guard remaining inside the building, and he had climbed up a beam and was bear-hugging it and crying. A grown man who was built like a professional wrestler, I mean the size of Hulk Hogan, and he was crying. Well, the band continued playing and they, without missing a beat. The next thing I know, I heard the crash of this iron fence that had surrounded the stage, and the crowd began to surge forward. And I just knew that at any moment, law enforcement's going to show up, and they're going to arrest everyone. I just wanted to enjoy a simple concert, not be in the middle of a riot. Well, I, I didn't want to go towards the stage like the crowd was, but I had no choice. I was being pressed hard, and it was either, hey, you keep stepping forward, or you're going to fall and you're going to be crushed under the feet of everybody. So against my will, and as I was just as scared as that one guard was, I kept pressing with them so as not to be crushed. Now, these people by the seashore apparently had become just as bad. But, you know, they had better reasons. They had good reasons. Many of them were bringing their sick loved ones or their injured friends. And many were expecting Jesus to heal them themselves. But there were just too many people surrounding him. They couldn't get close enough. So I imagine that people began just pushing and shoving, just trying to get closer and closer. They would see an opening and try to squeeze into it. Now, normally, it would be a good thing to see a crowd of this size be excited, you know, about people, just to hear about a crowd of people like this, everyone trying to get closer to Jesus. But the motives of the people were not the best. Now, I'm not going to fault them over that. If you have a sick loved one or a child that's in pain, you would do almost anything to see that pain taken away from them. And, you know, they had heard that some people had received healing just by touching the hem of his garment. So I can't really blame the the crowd for pressing against him, wanting to get closer. But I can't help but wonder how many people were there to hear what Jesus was saying, to hear his messages. The priorities were off here. These miracles and these healings, they were just done to demonstrate that Jesus has authority from above. The miracles are evidence that we can see that he is indeed the Son of God, just as he claims. But for some people, miracles were all they came there for. And it's for this reason, if you remember, that Jesus had to leave Capernaum previously for a short time. In Mark 1, 38, it said, He said to them, Let us go somewhere else to the town's nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. Now, healing was important. Physical well-being is important, but the message of salvation and the message of the kingdom of God should always be number one. But sadly, for most people, especially those in the crowd in those days, it was all about the flesh. They focused on the immediate instead of the eternal. Look at the pay difference today between clergy and doctors. It's not even close. Now, you might say, well, doctors will spend four to 12 years in in an institution being educated in their field. But with a pastor, the process of learning is lifelong. There never comes a point when you stop studying. You are constantly learning. And every single patient that a physician or doctor heals is going to die one day anyway. The body that they worked on is going to die. But the soul, that soul is going to live on somewhere in one of two places, either heaven or hell. To those who preach the gospel, those who carry God's word in the remote villages and other cities, They will get to see the ones that they ministered to in eternity, primarily due to the finished work of Jesus on the cross, of course, not by their own merit, but someone had to share it with them. Every person that was healed by Jesus himself in the Bible died later. Even Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, he died again. But those whose souls were devoted to Jesus while they were alive will one day receive a glorified body, and that body will never die, nor will it have any need of healing. So don't get me wrong. Doctors are important. They save lives. Nobody's disputing that. But what about the people who take the gospel to those who have never heard it? You know, I'm thankful for every medical procedure and the ones who have performed it to get me to where I am today. I've been through work-related injuries and sicknesses, and my life has indeed been in the hands of doctors over the time. But I'm even more thankful to the ones who pointed me to Jesus all along the way. 
one day this meat suit that I'm wearing, my body is going to die and it's going to go into the ground and it's going to be laid in the grave. But my soul, my soul will be in the presence of God. And one day I will inhabit a better body for eternity. I sure hope the other one looks a lot better than this one. Matters of the soul, things that are everlasting, they should take precedence. This is why Jesus had them secure a boat. This way he could tactfully step away from the crowds and give them what they really needed, the word. Let us move on into verses 11 and 12. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, You are the Son of God. And he earnestly warned them not to tell who he was. We have seen this happen before. Those who were demon-possessed, they would scream, they would flop, they would act out every time that they encountered Jesus, and rightly so. They fear him. The day is coming when he is going to cast them into the lake of fire. So they knew who he was. Now they also fear another place besides this lake of fire, the abyss. You might have it in your Bible as the pit. Right now, there are some fallen angels in this place called the abyss under lock and key. They are the worst of the worst, the baddest of the bad. Some of these were cast in there during the time of the flood, some likely even before then for things that we don't have a record of. But it's kind of like the death row, the the worst block that you could find on a prison. And that's another study for a later time. But Revelation speaks of some of those who are being held in this abyss that will be released upon the world to wreak havoc again for a short time during the tribulation. So those demons that have spent the last several thousand years harassing humanity, those that we read about being cast out in the Gospels, they're going to look like sweet and cuddly puppies next to the demons that are in the holding tank in the abyss. Consider it, like I said, the death row of fallen angels. Even the demons don't want to go there and share a cell with these guys. Remember the story in Luke about the deranged man in the graveyard? He was inhabited by multiple demons. Listen to what they said in these verses in Luke chapter 8, verses 29 through 31. For he had commanded the unclean spirits to come out of the man, for it had seized him many times, and he was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard, and yet he would break his bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. Well, you know the rest of the story. Rather than being cast into the abyss, they were content to be cast into a herd of pigs and they ran off the cliff while inside of these pigs and drowned in the sea. You know, this was the invention of deviled ham. Well, okay, at the worst case, it was suicide. All puns aside, they feared Jesus because of his authority to throw them into the abyss. Now, people wonder why they don't hear about more cases of demonic possessions just like there was in Bible times. Oh, it's there. Trust me. It's all around you. It's even in some mega churches these days. And in fact, they're even behind pulpits. They're preaching a watered down gospel that centers on pleasing the flesh and pointing people to anything but Christ. The only thing different about things today and in the Bible times is the lack of outburst from these demons. They like to stay undercover. They don't want people to know who they really are. They disguise themselves as messengers of light and they even hide in religion. That's why they were often found in these synagogues where the Pharisees were. You would think that the Pharisees would be upset over a demon being inside their place of worship to begin with. Why would a demon feel comfortable inhabiting their worship service? Why why were they not questioning, hey, why is a demon in our church? You know, were they that far from God already? They didn't care about that. They didn't care about the fact that a demon resided in one of their church members in the synagogue there. They just wanted to kill the one who cast out these demons because he did it on the Sabbath. I dare say that these Pharisees, they could go to Ancestry.com and find out that there's some deviled ham in their DNA as well. So every time that Jesus come around, these demons panicked. They screamed. You know, they knew that their time could possibly be up any minute. And with one simple command from Jesus, they could be cast into this abyss where they do not want to go. So they screamed. And they would identify Jesus as the Son of God or the Holy One of God. And each time he would silence them. Why? 
Well, the Pharisees, they're already accusing him of doing these miracles and great feats by the power of Satan. So these demons popping out and saying his name constantly is not helping that case. And everyone knows that the devil is the father of all lies, and his minions aren't trustworthy either. But this time, they cannot tell a lie, because they know who Jesus is and they're scared to death. So over and over, we see them in the pages of the Bible. They would lose their cool, and they would blow their cover and react to Jesus. They just could not help it. And each time, Jesus would silence them, and quickly, he did not need the heralding and the announcing by fallen angels. He has already been announced by angels who were still faithful to the Father, by John the Baptist, and by the Father himself. Who needs the testimony of demons when you have all that? So let's continue on into verses 13 through 15 of Mark chapter 3. And he went up on the mountain and summoned those whom he himself wanted, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, so that they would be with him, and that he could send them out to preach, and to have the authority to cast out the demons. As I always say, one should always study all four Gospels in harmony, just so you have a complete picture. Luke gives us another detail about this journey Jesus took to the mountain before calling the disciples. In Luke chapter 6, verse 12, it says, It was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. He had spent the entire night in prayer with the Father. A big decision was about to be made. The men he was about to choose would be entrusted to carry on his ministry after his ascension. Now, I'm certain he already foreknew the ones that were going to be chosen. But I'm guessing here, my bet was that he was praying for them that they would be able to withstand the pressure that would be placed upon them, that God would protect them until their appointed time, and that they would continue to be effective and faithful to their calling. Now, I wasn't up on the mountain that night, so I have no way of knowing what he prayed. But looking at the longest prayer that Jesus ever gave, it was found in the Gospel of John, I believe around chapter 17, in that he prayed for the disciples. He prayed for them. He prayed for us, those who would believe because of them many times. Now at this point, there were hundreds of people following Jesus, but here the 12 get singled out from the many. It was these 12 that he would bestow apostolic authority so that they would cast out demons and perform healings just as he had done. Now this wasn't given to every disciple among the crowds. This ability to heal and to cast out demons and to do miracles wasn't upon the hundreds of people who you could call disciples who followed Jesus, only to these 12 that he singles out right here. It wasn't This ability wasn't given to TV evangelists who claim they could heal you if you only send them a thousand dollars. This ability was not bestowed to some guy who travels the country with a big tent and puts up a sign that says, tells you to come expecting a miracle. This ability was limited to the 12. Now, why 12? What's so special about the number 12? I mean, why not seven? Why not three? Why not 40? Those are recurring numbers that we see all throughout scripture. What is the significance of him singling out 12 disciples? Well, at the beginning of his ministry, he was found driving people out of the temple with a whip. I mean, he'd overthrew the table and the money changers. He'd upset all the operations that were going on there. And he constantly verbally attacked the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the scribes. He had called them out over and over, the, all of the religious establishment. He called them whitewashed tombs. They had a pristine appearance on the outside, but on the inside they stank with the bones of men who were spiritually dead. Now, after the triumphal entry, he warned the people to beware of the leaven or the teachings of the Pharisees. He essentially stated that they had failed at their jobs as leaders of Israel. Their job was the spiritual well-being of the people that made up the 12 tribes, and they had failed that. They had polluted God's word. They had elevated themselves. They had added their own traditions to God's law, and they had rejected God's promised Messiah. So we're going to see here in a minute that they had also committed the one unforgivable sin. This will probably be in the next message. So these leaders, these Pharisees, they're on the way out. They have failed. And by appointing 12 people to, to replace them, become future leaders, Jesus was essentially condemning these Pharisees, condemning the religious elite. 
elite because they did not recognize their Messiah, or at least for the time being. In Luke, Jesus was discussing the coming millennial kingdom with his disciples. Now listen carefully as he explains to them the new order of rule coming to the renewed nation of Israel in which he will be seated upon his rightful throne. In Luke 22, verses 28 through 30, You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. The leaders of the nation at the time of Jesus' ministry, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, they had failed. And they were essentially fired by this right here. What Jesus did in choosing 12 men that day went far beyond, you know, just picking those who's going to carry things on in his absence. He chose replacement leaders. In the future kingdom, which will be established after the Great Tribulation, after the time of Jacob's trouble, when Jesus will rightfully rule the world from Jerusalem, these 12 men are going to be leading in place of those Pharisees. Now, ironically, these Pharisees who thought they had the inside track from God, the majority of them will be nowhere in sight in this millennial kingdom. There will be new leaders in Israel, under Jesus' ultimate authority, of course, and minus Judas, who would be replaced soon by Matthias. But these 12 apostles, or disciples who become apostles, will sub-rule over Israel in a millennial kingdom. Each tribe will have a leader. Each leader will be one of these men who would be persecuted and martyred by those who are the establishment at this time. So the disciples are going to go from martyr to ruler. The 12 chosen by Jesus will rule the 12 tribes in the millennial kingdom. Now you think that is great, that these 12s will be honored in such a great way. Just look what happens after the millennial kingdom. At the end of this 1,000 year reign of Christ on earth, the devil is going to be released from chains, which had him bound during the 1,000 years for a short time. He's going to wage war on Jesus and on the believers, or he's going to try to anyway. That's going to fizzle out like a cheap three-year-old firework that's been left out in the rain. Then comes the new Jerusalem, the eternal city. This will be our eternal abode. Look at this description that's found in Revelation chapter 21, beginning in verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and at the twelve gates twelve angels, and names were written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Now the Old Covenant began with God and twelve tribes of Israel and a Passover lamb. The New Covenant began with God's Son and twelve disciples at the Lord's Supper, in which Jesus became the Passover lamb that was sacrificed. Now, the consummation of the marriage between the Lamb of God and His bride, the church, will take place in this eternal city, the New Jerusalem. It's going to be in the presence of our Creator and our Savior, the triune God, and all of those who were washed in the blood of the Lamb. We're going to be in a city that bears the name of these twelve apostles on the foundation. So the choosing of twelve men that day meant so much more than just giving advanced classes to a group of certain disciples. He turned them from disciples into apostles. They were sent to do his work. From student to apostle, and from apostle to co-judge, and from co-judges to an eternal place of honor with their very names etched into the foundation for eternity. That's quite a promotion, something that probably even astonished these guys. Now let's go over each one of these 12 men who Jesus chose after an entire night of prayer. Let's look at their life. Let's look at the reason why each one of them was chosen from among the hundreds and how they spent their lives serving Jesus. This is like a sneak peek inside the master carpenter's toolbox. He has selected a very interesting mix of people to fill his toolbox. And what I think is just as strange as the people that he selected to use is the absence of the ones you think he might have picked. 
Not one of these 12 men is a scholar. There's no teachers in the mix, no rabbis in the mix. There's no theologians, anybody that's even remotely a theologian. The reason for this was so that nobody could say that these men did what they did by their own power or by their own knowledge. God chose the simple things and the foolish things and the weak things to astonish the wise. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, it says, Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. You would think that were to be at least one Pharisee in the mix. Well, there would be one later with the conversion of the Apostle Paul. But in this initial selection, in the first 12, there were none. Now, I imagine there were at least a few Pharisees who could have been persuaded to follow him had Jesus saw fit to call one of them. Nicodemus, for example, he wasn't hostile towards Jesus. Rather, he was curious at first. We see him in the early chapters of John coming to Jesus at night, asking questions. Later on in John chapter 7, he boldly stood up to the other Pharisees. They were already plotting the arrest and execution of Jesus. And in John chapter 7, verses 50 and 51, Nicodemus, who he who came to him before being one of them, said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? Nicodemus was also there at the death of Jesus, doing whatever he could to help. There was also the revered teacher Gamaliel, the one whom the apostle Paul sat at the feet when he was a young man and learned. Gamaliel was wise enough to advise the others to drop their case against Jesus. They said, if this is something of man, it's going to fall apart and fizzle out on their own. And he had mentioned several other people who stepped up to claim to be the Messiah, who had a following and everything fell apart. But Gamaliel told them, but if this is of God, you're not going to be able to stop it, and you might even find yourself fighting against God. So he could have called Nicodemus, he could have called Gamaliel, but for the time being, there were no experts of the law in the Lord's toolbox. Just an odd combination of various men of whom the only thing major that they had in common was the fact that they were common. So now let's get to know these fellows. And I know this has taken up quite a bit of time, but I'm going to give you a look at these people here in a way that you might not have ever noticed them before, just exactly who these men are. So in Mark chapter 3, let's go ahead and cover verses 16 through 19. And he appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James. To them he gave the name Boanerges, which means son of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, there are four different lists of these disciples found in Scripture. It's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts. Now, there are variations of the names, but they all list the 12 same men, all except for the list in Acts, of course, for by that time, Judas was dead and having been replaced by Matthias. Now, the variations in names is actually a listing of the nicknames that many of these men went by. And here in Mark, we're going to get the nicknames that they went by amongst each other. Many of them received their nickname by Jesus themselves. And I love how we get to see in Mark their nicknames. To me, that shows how intimate this group was, how, how close these guys grew together, having lived amongst each other and served Jesus together. It shows the warmth between a group of guys who likely would have never assembled together outside of being called by Jesus. Also, in each of these four lists, we'll see that these disciples are always divided into three different groups of four. Now, the order is switched around slightly, but the structure remains the same. The first four, the, the first group of four, is always Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Now, Peter and Andrew were brothers. James and John were brothers. Andrew is sometimes included in the inner circle of three. I mean, every time you see these stories, that Peter, uh, Jesus went off with Peter, James, and John. You know, Peter and James and John at the Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John further into the garden. Those were the three whom Jesus was the most intimate with, the closest with. Peter, James, and John were often with Jesus when the others were not. 
But sometimes there was a fourth in this inner group, and that's Andrew. Now, group two consists of Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, and Thomas. Just like in group one, where Peter is always listed first, Philip is always listed first in group two. Out of each subgroup, there seems to arise a leader of the four people. So Philip is possibly a leader of group two. We know some of the things about these guys, but they appear in scripture less than the guys in group one. Then you have group three what we would call the C-string, to use a sports analogy. They're not the starters. They're not the backup people. I'm talking about the kind of players that sit on the bench and maybe till the last 30, 45 seconds of a game and then get to get out and make an appearance if they play at all. This is what we would rank this C-string as, group three. We have James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot. Now, James, son of Alphaeus, is always the leader of this section of men as well. But, you know, very little is known about these four men, of course, with the exception of Judas. And Judas, if you'll notice, is always listed last for obvious reasons. Now, though these men, they appear in Scripture less than others, that doesn't mean that they were less important. That doesn't mean that they didn't do anything, that they weren't active in the ministry. They were probably just as busy as Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, but you you don't see it because scripture doesn't record all of it. Now, they were all given the same power and authority by Jesus this day. They all did what they were told to do, and that is to go out and to preach the gospel. Even the guys in group three, they had the ability to heal people. They had the ability to cast out demons. Just because we don't have passages of scripture recording them doing so doesn't mean that they weren't active. But with the exception of Judas, all 12 of these men are going to have their names on the foundation of the New Jerusalem, as we just mentioned. Each of these 12 men will be resurrected to judge the 12 tribes of Israel during the Millennial Kingdom. So they are all equally important. So now let's take a look at each one and what their nicknames were and how they were used to further the gospel. To begin with, Simon Peter. Originally, he was Simon bar Jonah, which means Simon, son of Jonah. In the days before they used last names or before they used surnames, people were usually identified by their given name first, followed by either a parent's name or the name of the town in which they grew up in. We know that Peter was a fisherman by trade before beginning to follow Jesus. And we've seen so far in Mark that he has a rather large house in Capernaum, which became the headquarters for them the whole time they were there. Peter was also a married man. One of the early miracles that Jesus had record, was recorded in Mark was the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. So we know that Peter was married and his mother-in-law lived with him. Later on, Peter's wife accompanied him as he traveled around preaching the gospel. It might have been in one of the letters to the Corinthians where the Apostle Paul says, do we not have the right to take along a believing spouse such as Peter and some of the other apostles? So we know that Peter's wife traveled with him and preached the gospel or as he preached the gospel. He was given this nickname, Cephas, or Peter, and the meaning of that name is rock. Now, he would become one of the leaders of the early church, but his role of leader began originally in this group of 12 men, in these disciples. Now, Peter, he was far from perfect. He would make a, bro a bold proclamation of faith. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then in the very next breath, say the worst possible thing. One time, he vowed to follow Jesus to the death, and the same day, he denied knowing Jesus three times. And when Jesus was arrested, Peter pulls out a sword and tries to take on 200 Roman soldiers by himself. And obviously he wasn't a very good swordsman because out of all the hacking and swinging he'd done, he managed to take an ear off of Malchus, one of the servants there. But he's trying to take them on by himself. He's big, he's bold, he's brave, fighting 200 Romans on one guy. But yet he was afraid to be known as a Christian outside of the trial of Jesus, which led to his denial of him. Even years later, Peter would eat with the Gentiles unless fellow Jews were there. Paul had to rebuke him for holding on to the old covenant ways of being exclusive to the Gentiles. 
But it was the boldness of this imperfect leader that made him the natural choice to be leader of the twelve. It was Peter who challenged the authorities many times. It was Peter who defended the actions of the group in the face of persecution. That time they were arrested for preaching and they were beaten and flogged and when they were released, they were ordered to no longer preach in the name of Jesus. And Peter says, whether it's right to obey God or obey, obey men, you decide. It was Peter who preached a powerful convicting message at Pentecost in which over 3,000 people were saved. So that is the man formerly known as Simon who was renamed Peter or Rock by Jesus. He wasn't called Rock because he had rocks in his head or a stubborn mind, but to remind him of what he was going to need to be after the ascension of Jesus. Then we come to James and John, sons of Zebedee. We've often seen that they too were fishermen. They had a large fishing business with their father, who is named multiple times himself. The Bible mentions Zebedee about six times or so, but it doesn't say why he was an important man in his area. Maybe it's because he was a, a commercial person. He was a business owner. He was perhaps well known to many of the merchants throughout town. Maybe it's because it's kind of fun just to say Zebedee. That name just rolls off your tongue so easy. But the story isn't about Zebedee, so scripture doesn't focus on him. But later on, at the arrest of Jesus, we see that his son, John, was known to the high priest, and therefore he was given access inside to witness the trial of Jesus. So perhaps that connection that John had with the high priest was through his father Zebedee. But both James and John were also known for their boldness. Not quite at the level of Peter, but pretty close. It was the bold, fiery preaching of James that earned him the honor of being the first of the twelve to be martyred. Not the first martyr, that title would go to Stephen, but the first of the twelve to be killed. Herod just had to shut this James up. He was preaching so effectively, he's so on fire, the only thing that he could do was to have James killed. James and John also both earned the nickname Boanerges, which it said in that verse, which means sons of thunder. No, that doesn't mean that they loved to eat beans and made a lot of noise after supper. Not that kind of thunder. That name was given to them when they were leaving a small town that had treated them poorly. They refused to receive the gospel and they just basically run them out of town. So James and John asked Jesus, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and burn these people up? You know, they're eager, they're zealous but in a wrong way sometimes. You know, we would call that being ill-tempered or we'd call it hot-headed. That's not a good thing for people who are called to be messengers of the gospel of grace. You know, I can almost imagine a smile on Jesus' face as he called them by this nickname from time to time, Sons of Thunder. You know, this name also had a serious meaning, though. It's to remind James and John of their weakness. It's to remind them of their temper so that they should not repeat the attitude that they had that day. When I was a young man, I had many teachers that would tell me that I'm never going to amount to squat. Rick, you're never going to amount to squat. I guess that was just a form of negative reinforcement. You know, kind of like if you tell somebody they can't do something, if a person is hard-headed, they're going to try twice as hard in order to prove you wrong. Well, I don't know if any of you are watching out there, but to all of you teachers who told me that I would never amount to squat, I say to you, how did you know? No, I'm kidding. Actually, that made me try harder. I wanted, I try harder to be something though. I wanted to prove them wrong. I wanted to be squat. So when Jesus named Simon Peter Rock, it was to remind him of who he needed to become. When he called James and John son of thunder, it was to remind them of who they should not be. So now let's go on to number four of our group, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. We know that he lived with his brother in the house in Capernaum. He was the first man out of the twelve to be called to follow Jesus. He was originally a disciple of John the Baptist. And we know from the beginning of our study in Mark that he was present the day that Jesus came to be baptized. When John the Baptist made the proclamation, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Andrew witnessed that. Andrew was there baptizing people with John in the Jordan River. He saw the scene where heaven was ripped open and the Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove. And God spoke audibly from the sky, declaring, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. 
Andrew went and told his brother, Peter, that they had found the Messiah, and he brought him to meet Jesus. Now, he knew that his older brother was likely going to take over. You know, Simon had always tended to be the one to want to run the conversation, to want to run the show. Maybe you know somebody like that. They always just want to take over and just run the whole conversation themselves. But Andrew was content to be scooted aside. He didn't care if his brother was going to push him aside. He didn't care about being scooted to number four in the order of the intimacy of the disciples when he was the first disciple, the first one to follow Jesus. He was happy just bringing others to Jesus. In fact, nearly every time that we see Andrew, he is doing just that. In John chapter 6, when Jesus made mention that they're going to feed the 5,000 people that were there, Philip began focusing on the enormous cost. You know, it's going to be, you know, two years wages to feed all these people. We don't have the ability to pay for that much food. Andrew found a young boy that had five loaves of bread and two fish. Now, of course, it wasn't enough. And even Andrew said that. He says, I have a boy here. He had brought him with him. Says he has five loaves of bread and two fish. He goes, and Andrew said, but what is that among so many? He had bought the boy to Jesus, not knowing how this is going to be done, but to see what the Lord could do with that. So Andrew was a perfect model of humility. He was never jealous of others stealing the limelight. He wasn't upset about being excluded at times when Jesus would just slip off with just the three of the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. He was just ready for the times when he would be included. So the church needs more Andrews today. The next one on our list is Philip. Philip is the leader of group two. He is from Bethsaida. He's only mentioned eight times in the Bible, and four of those eight times is just within the list of disciples like we had just read right here. Now, there were many Philips in the New Testament that he often gets confused for. As I've said before, in that day, you could throw a rock and hit 12 Marys and six Johns. Well, apparently there's quite a few Philips as well. Many people, myself included, have mistaken him for Philip the Evangelist. And Herod had two sons by the name of Philip that we read about. About. And the Philip mentioned in Acts 21 as being one of the seven set aside to become like the first deacons and such was Philip the Evangelist. Not this guy. Not Philip the Apostle. So what did this Philip do? What did this Philip the Apostle do? Well, he was the one that brought the news to Nathaniel that the Messiah was there, that the Messiah was among them. And he was bringing someone to Jesus, just like Andrew did with his brother Peter. He was bringing someone to Jesus. Now, Nathaniel, we're going to study him next. We're going to see in a minute his name is actually Bartholomew. Now, he and Philip are always listed together, and they're close in friendship. And we'll get to the to the deaths of these 12 in another video sometime. We're going to see the amazing faith and passion for preaching that this man had. Just kind of a sneak preview. As he was being crucified, and it lasted for days, tradition holds, that Philip this whole time spent the whole time preaching the gospel to all who would listen while he was dying. A very, very dedicated young man whom we know little to nothing about other than church tradition and other things, but still someone that's admirable at least. Now, we mentioned Nathaniel, or Bartholomew, as Mark calls him here. This is the Nathaniel that we had just talked about. We don't know that much about him either, but Bartholomew is a nickname that was given to him, and it identifies him a little bit further. Remember, Bar actually means son of, like Simon Bar Jonah means Simon, son of Jonah. So this guy was Bar Tomei. He is the son of a man named Tomei. But Nathaniel was his real name. That in the Hebrew means God has given. Everybody wants to label Thomas for being a doubter or a skeptic. What about this guy? What about Bartholomew or Nathaniel, whichever you want to call him? This guy was actually one of the first doubters. Now, in Thomas's defense, what was it that Thomas had trouble believing in? that Jesus had risen from the dead. That was big. That's something that you don't see every day. So for Thomas, you know, not to believe that someone rose from the dead, I'm going to give Thomas the benefit of the doubt for that. I'm not going to condemn him for doubting. And Thomas didn't say that it was impossible. Thomas didn't say this was something that God couldn't do. What Thomas had said was, until I see him, until I put my hands where the holes were and everything, then I'll believe. He left the possibility open. 
psalmist wasn't closed-minded, but we have a similar situation being played out when Nathaniel was told about Jesus by Philip. Look in John chapter 1 and verses 45 through 51. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Does that not sound a little bit like Thomas when Jesus appeared to him? My Lord and my God. And it goes on in verse 50. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So while we may not have much to read about the ministry and the life of Nathanael, we know that he was used greatly by God and that Jesus foretold right here of an exciting ministry that lay in store for this guy. There is so much that happened that we don't know about, but maybe one day we might get the chance to hear about these things from these very apostles themselves. Our next one in our list is Matthew also known as Levi. We've covered him just a few videos ago. He was the least lovable to the people, with the exception of Judas. Matthew was a tax collector. They were considered to be traitors. A friend of Rome was an enemy of Israel. But he gave all that up one day when Jesus walked by, looked at him, and said, follow me. He abandoned a tax booth that paid his own money. He had paid for it with his own money. He had bought the right to collect taxes from Rome. He liked likely hadn't even made his own investment back yet, but he didn't care. He walked away from everything, and Matthew never looked back, not once. This man, who was hated by the Jews for being a, a servant of Rome, ended up focusing his ministry to those very people. The gospel according to Matthew is full of prophecies that a Jewish audience would be familiar with. And Matthew made it a point to show how each one of those prophecies that they knew was fulfilled in the life of Jesus. He was a valuable asset to the group, and through him we have the Gospel of Matthew in our Bibles. So let's go on to Thomas now. When you say Thomas, what is the first word that pops into your mind? What is he best known for? Doubting. That poor guy. I mean, he's done so much in his life, and that's the one thing that we remember him for throughout the ages. Just because he was skeptic about the most radical thing he had ever heard in his life, he's labeled a doubter forever. Well, old Thomas actually had a nickname as well. Mark is good about giving us the nicknames. Didymus which also means the twin. Now, we don't know why he was called the twin. I don't know if Thomas had a twin brother. Maybe Thomas might have bore some resemblance to one of the other disciples. He might have even looked like Jesus. We don't know. We don't know what Jesus looked like. He's not the six-foot-tall, white-skinned, blonde-haired guy that you see on posters in a lot of churches. We aren't told who Thomas looks like. But his nickname is the twin even though we call him the doubter. But that's what his friends called him. The twelve that he lived with and served Jesus with called him twin. Now, to be honest, haven't we all had our Thomas moments at one time or another? And I love how he was restored. His declaration after Jesus appeared to him was astounding. My Lord and my God. Now, as you notice, the further we go down in this list, the less and less information we have about these guys. But don't let that fool you into thinking that they were of any less importance. Behind every famous work, there are usually many people behind the scenes that make things happen. You just don't see them as much. So we're moving on now to James, son of Alphaeus. 
Now, I've heard teachers say that we don't know much about James, son of Alphaeus, and we know even less about this Alphaeus guy who was his father. Now, I don't know how many people were named Alphaeus, but there is another mention of a man named Alphaeus once before. And in the same connotation, the name of his son was given in accordance with this. In Mark 2, 14, as he passed by, he saw Levi, which is Matthew, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth. Now, is is it the same Alphaeus? You know, if that was the case, that would make James a half-brother of Matthew. However, we just aren't 100% sure. We don't know if it was one Alphaeus that was a father to both of them or whether it was two different men named Alphaeus. Now, this James himself, he is always the first mentioned in group three. And we know from Mark 15, 40, a little more about his family. We know that he had a mother named Mary. We know that she had become a believer at some point. This James also has a nickname that's given in some of the lists. He is known as James the Less. Now, that doesn't mean that he is less important than the other Jameses that we read about. That doesn't mean he's less important in God's eyes than James, the son of Zebedee, or than James, the brother of Jesus. You know, that doesn't mean he is inferior to any of these men in any way. The Greek word used there in this nickname is micro, which means small, little. Technically, James the Littler. We call it James the Less, but a literal translation is James the Littler, James the Smaller. Perhaps he was a really short guy. This is just speculation, but maybe he was the height of Zacchaeus. I know of a few guys that have gone by the nickname Shorty over the years. Now, I'm sure this wasn't a name of their choice, but they just rolled with it. They knew that people meant no disrespect by it. Sometimes it seems like men, we can be cruel when we give each other nicknames. You know, we might say, well, you're an ugly old bald-headed fart, or you're a senile old coot, or just something like that. And it's, it's mostly, in good cases, a form of endearment, a sign of affection. And if you're a close friend or a good buddy, you're going to have a nickname. And the more embarrassing the nickname, the closer the bond of friendship. Now, keep that in mind as we move on to the next of the twelve. Thaddeus. Now, his real name was Judas, son of James. Now, being as how there was already another Judas in the group, this is why he likely went by another name, why he was given a nickname. Remember, at this calling, nobody but Jesus knew that Judas Iscariot was going to be a traitor. But everybody else knew there was another Judas in this group, so we're going to call him Thaddeus. So we can see why he went by another name at first to avoid confusion among the group. Later, it's because nobody wanted to be called Judas after what the other one had done. In fact, in John's gospel, it lists this man as Judas, not Iscariot. He wanted to make that clear, a, a disassociation between him and the other Judas. Even in the book right before Revelation, that guy's name is Judas. In fact, he, it's been abbreviated, and the title of the book is Jude, is how he identifies himself. Do you know anybody by the name of Judas these days? It's not a very popular name, and for the reason that you might think. So I think the nickname that he had, though, Thaddeus, is just about as bad as Judas, if not worse. In his study called Twelve Ordinary Men, John MacArthur researched the meaning of the, of the nicknames of these men, and especially the two nicknames that Thaddeus had. Thaddeus was one name. Labaius was another nickname. Thaddeus means mama's boy. Not really a flattering name to be called as an adult male, is it? Now, we don't know why the name Mama's Boy, Thaddeus, was given to him. Perhaps he had a little bit of trouble when he left home. When he went to follow Jesus, maybe Mama threw a big fit and his big crying meltdown, whatever it might be. Maybe his Mama would come out with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich wrapped up for him with a little fruit roll-up or something. I don't know what the deal is. So for some whatever reason, he was given the nickname Thaddeus, Mama's Boy. Now, it's an insider thing. We aren't told about it. It was just something that the 12 knew. You had to be there. It's one of those kind of things. And I bet there's a snicker among the 12 every time Thaddeus was introduced to that. Yeah, I'm Matthew or Levi, and this here is this guy, and, and that over there, that that's Mama's boy over there in a the corner. And he'd be like, shut up, son of thunder, you know, something like that. His other nickname, Labaius, isn't actually much more honoring than Mama's boy. It means heart child. 
But I'm thinking this might just be an indicator of the tender heartedness of this apostle. He was more likely in touch with his emotion than these other guys who grew up be, being tough guys, trying to be burly and macho all the time. Maybe this Thaddeus, maybe this Labaius, instead of being a mama's boy, was just really more sensitive than the other men. We don't really know. It was an insider thing, but it's interesting how Mark gives us the nicknames that they went by. To me, it shows me the warmth and the tenderness of the group as they all kind of picked on each other in a lighthearted way. Now let's move on to the next to last on our list, Simon the Zealot. Depending on your translation, it might say Simon the Canaanite. Now it doesn't say Canaanite, being from the land of Canaan, from Canaan, but that is the name, or it is a word that's translated zealot. He's another hothead and is known as a political revolutionary. That's what a zealot is. Someone who is ready to do anything to see Rome kicked out of Israel. And so this is what his main goal is all about. He's on fire and dead set on helping anyone who would dare take on Rome. Some people might believe this is why Judas Iscariot followed Jesus. You know, and maybe Simon the Zealot did the same thing. They've seen these crowds that followed Jesus, thousands upon thousands of people. They've seen how the religious leaders, though they despised Jesus, they feared him. Said so they wanted to stone him, but they didn't for fear of the crowds. So maybe that Simon the Zealot and Judas might have believed that Jesus was building up an army as these crowds followed. They were encouraged each time Jesus flustered the Pharisees and the scribes. They were excited when the triumphal entry came. People throwing down palm branches, shouting hope. Hosanna, and they were doing all of this stuff. You know, they were possibly excited, but not for the Messiah, not for God's Son. They were seeking a revolution. When Jesus did do the triumphal entry, he went up and cleansed the temple a second time. He fashioned a whip, drove out the money changers, preached a sermon against the Pharisees, and then left. He didn't assume a throne. He didn't form an army. He left the city, and then he went back and began talking about how he was going to die and be crucified and rise again on the third day. Well, so this is what they want. They were seeking a revolution, and it's quite possibly that that might have been why Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot joined. Again, just kind of seeing into things. This is speculation, but it's something to think about. The difference is between Judas and this Simon the Zealot, somewhere along the line, this zealot fell in line. He saw Jesus for who he really was and who he really is, and he spent his days no longer seeking to overthrow Rome, but to give his gospel, to give his life for the gospel. Literally, he would become a martyr himself. As a zealot, it's possible that he might have been a member of this secret group called the Sicarii. Now, these people were really assassins who would blend in with the common folks and conceal these small daggers. And whenever there's an opportunity to kill a Roman, especially a soldier, without attracting any attention, if they catch one off by himself out somewhere and they just take these small daggers and boom, they'd kill him and be done with it. I find it to be an odd combination in this group here. On one hand, you have a guy who worked for Rome, collecting taxes, extorting his own countrymen. And then on the other hand, you have this political radical who probably tried to kill all Romans. Yet these two men lived in harmony, the Simon the Zealot and Matthew. They lived in harmony and they served the Lord side by side. In any other scenario, one of them would have likely killed the other. So that leaves us with the last, Judas Iscariot. You know, I could spend a two-hour message on Judas Iscariot. I mean, any serious Bible student has to be fascinated about him in one point or another. We all know what Judas is famous for. And Judas was once a regal name. It was once a name to be desired. It was once a respected name. It comes derived from the name Judah. But now anyone bearing that name was identified as Judas, not Iscariot. They wanted to make sure that distinction was made. And like I said earlier, you don't see very many people today named Judas, all because of this guy. And he had a nickname as well besides traitor, Iscariot. Iscariot was not his last name. 
And it wasn't the last name of his father either. They did not have surnames in this day. His father was actually called the same thing. We're given the name of his father in Scripture. In John 6, 71, Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Judas was the son of Simon Iscariot, and Simon was said to have been married by outside traditions to a woman named Siberia, or Siberia. Now, this name doesn't sound Jewish. To me, I don't know whether she was an Israelite or not. If she was not, that would make Judas a half-breed and even more despised by true Israelites. So tradition holds that he was the son of Simon and Siboria, which is, we know from Scripture, is Simon of Iscariot. There means they were from the land of Cariot. Now, Iscariot and Cariot is actually the same. Cariot was a town in the southern part of Israel. And it's, at, it's south of Jerusalem, and it's actually one of two cities that shared the same name. I was looking for an illustration of a map that I can put up here that shows you where exactly Cariot is. One would show it on the right side or the east side of the Dead Sea. One would show it on the west side, and I'm thinking, which one is it? Do we not know which one? Then I looked into the meaning of Cariot, and it means twin cities. It was two cities that shared the same name. And only he was the only one of the twelve, not from the region of Galilee, which is in the far north. His family was from Cario. They're still inside Israel. They were still Israelites, or at least his father was, but they were not from Galilee. So Judas was naturally an outsider. But he was an outsider that served a purpose nonetheless. Jesus did not make a mistake in choosing Judas. The actions of Judas were foretold and predicted centuries ago. I believe it's Psalm 109, 8 that says, May his days of office be few, and may another take his place referring to his fallout and and deposition from being a a disciple and Matthias chosen to take his place. It was foretold in many places that was going to happen. Jesus even said himself, you know, but not every one of you is going to follow me. One of you is a devil. He even predicted it at the Last Supper as he was passing around the bread and identified who it was. So these actions of Judas were foretold and predicted centuries ago. That one would walk with the Messiah, one would eat with the Messiah, and also deny him and betray him. This wasn't something that he was forced to do. A lot of people struggle with this. You know, Judas had a choice. Each thing that he did, he made a decision. He made a choice on his own free will. Judas chose to steal from the money bag that they all shared. Judas chose to complain when the woman anointed Jesus' feet with the expensive perfume. Judas chose to sell Jesus out to the authorities that day in the upper room when he left, and he chose to identify him in the garden to the Roman soldiers by betraying him with a kiss as a signal to the guards. Now, God's foreknowledge of this did not override Judas' ability to make a decision. God just saw the future long before it happened. God has the ability to see the future as clearly, if not more clearly, than we can see the past. So we see that this ragtag group of very different people, these 12 people who had nothing in common except for the fact that they were common. They were as common as you. They were as common as me. Jesus turned the world of the first century upside down with these 12 men. Their work continues on even today. We worship and serve Jesus through the church, the church that they laid the foundation for. Twelve simple, common lay people. And now there are millions of us who name the name of Christ. We come from all walks of life. We come from many different trades. We come from many different professions. We come from many different nationalities. We come from wildly different past. We all have a different story. We all have a different testimony. But we all serve the same purpose and the same goal, and that is to know Christ and to make Him known.